Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Tom Lynn, and here today I have the pleasure of being joined by uh, Guido Giacomo Preparata, um, who um, I don't want to like put a label on uh, you. You know, you certainly are anarchist in your disposition, uh, not wanting to exist in the hive, but there's a whole sort of background, a career navigating the straits of academia and otherwise, which brings you here. Uh, I encountered you uh, initially through your interview, interviews on the Regeneration podcast. Uh, but you talk a lot of, about a lot of things that uh, coordinate with things we've discussed on this channel as well. And um, you, uh, so uh, a few years ago, you wrote this article, Technostructure, just as a way of leading into that conversation, uh, which is available on your website and um, you open with a quote from uh, Ernst Jünger, who he's an interesting fellow anyway. Um, and it might be worth just uh, reviewing the quote quickly as a way in. Uh, the English translation you provide, I won't risk butchering the German, which is also there is, um, then, when a number of lodges will have formed around the doctrine of amoral technicity, autochthonous forces will be drawn to their malignancy in order to reawaken, with their help, the ancient power, the longing for which is always throbbing at the bottom of their heart. And then in your article, you go on to analyze, and your analysis in response to another um, article uh, by uh, someone else, I believe, the Vat or Professor Fabri or Fabrice, um, but we don't have to, you know, get into that. Uh, but that's how you open it, and uh, maybe you could elaborate on this notion of amoral technicity, and then the response uh, that Junger is suggesting there in the quote. Yes. So, yeah, that was um, on the occasion of a, uh, a, a conference, a seminar that was organized at the uh, Gregorian University, which is the um, flagship Jesuit university in Rome at the time that Francis had um, come out with his encyclical Laudato Si on, which was the, the ecological one, the green one, which expressed concerns about the environment and so on and so forth. And everybody was I'm pretty thrilled by that because it was the first time that uh, such an argument was uh, was 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 explored by a pope in uh, in such a way. Uh, anyway, so and it was about, uh, but the discussion was about um, how uh, our world, which is this modern world, and there's this talk of fourth industrial revolution where everything now is computerized. It isn't just computerized, but there's also that thing, the ghost in the machine or the matrix type of monster thing uh, lurking in the background. And uh, so it was a response to that kind of a, an insight and just pretty common insight by this professor at the University of Pisa. Uh, and the response to that was the, um, in seminal form, this, uh, this article about the techno structure. So when, about Junger, well, Junger is for me, uh, I don't know, possibly one of the most, most extraordinary writers that, that I've ever read. I find him from a stylistic viewpoint, perfect. I've never read anything so perfect as his prose. And he is deeply fascinating because you know that he's in, he has been an initiate. You know, he's into, into the secret of a lot of things and uh, was, and he's, and he's also, uh, there's something, disturbing about him because even though he managed and I don't want to spend too much time about Jung but since you since that's the begin it's the initial quote and we'll get to that um Junger is 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 someone who has not been somehow passed through customs of the old German guard uh, of that period he's very well known in Europe very poorly known in the United States very little of his is translated uh, that's also interesting there's no question uh, in my mind, though it's just not the way it's portrayed, uh, after some hints that have been given to me and rereading him, 
that this, this is someone who was very much in the Nazi camp in the early stages, but from a very elitist viewpoint. He kept his distance from what he considered uh, too crude of a political movement, but he was in that camp. And the war, I think, uh, and he was um, a war veteran who wrote these books about World War I, uh, where it's a celebration of war. I mean, they, they are quite disquieting, but just phenomenally interesting books. And then he also had a commission during World War II and after, but his younger son died in that war and something changed. And so he eventually abandoned all that attraction to the dark, uh, the dark powers. Uh, uh, you know, he was kind of a Sith, right? That's what he was. And, um, but it, and so all of that pervades his, his vision. He died at uh, 101 years of age and converted to Catholicism shortly before that. So, uh, it, one would need a long time to discuss about Junger. What was this story? Uh, so going to technique and all of that, Junger's vision is very much a spiritualist vision that this world is an expression of higher spiritual forces, most of them evil. He is not a Christian. He's not, he says himself, I'm not anti-Christian at all. I'm just not a Christian. What he says by that is he's a Gnostic. He doesn't, he obviously believes, he doesn't believe in this story of the good God in charge of the world. Uh, he doesn't see it that way at all. He believes that the powers of devastation and of evil, that's that's the most superficial and crass layer of his thought, one could say, is, is definitely, if not in charge, but overwhelmingly present on this planet. And um, and the discussion with the Laudato Si was, well, what are we, what is this? So, and I'm coming to my point, I don't want, what are we talking about? And uh, the things that were said during that conference was, and, and this is very, and nowadays everybody talks about the power of technology and, and we go back to uh, all these movies like The Matrix or, uh, or, or, or the computer in uh, 2001, uh, Space uh, Odyssey, where the machine takes over, right? This is the fear of everybody. Or in the movie, The Terminator, where the machines uh, will rule the world and we are increasingly in the grip of this faceless, mechanized, no, not even mechanized, uh, magnetic power, which is not centered any in centralizing and centered anywhere. And, uh, and this changes completely the sociology and our vision of the world. So all of this, uh, I call it postmodern sociology of power not existing anymore, everything being liquid, they say. I mean, that's a bunch of nonsense. But it comes from that. And I guess this professor started with this, you know, he just, he, he put a lot of emphasis on the story about our iPhones or computers that rebooting, once you're connected to the net, they reboot on their own. They ask you permission, kind of, but they do it themselves. And he was uh, using this, leveraging this example and saying, isn't this crazy, right? It, it, we, it feels very much that we are already in the matrix. Like these machines are now doing what they want. Without even asking you, they're going to reboot no matter what, and that's not you doing things, it's them, and you are so dependent on them, and so on and so forth. So a million things have been written about this, and I say, yes, it's true. We are finding ourselves in this new world, in this brave new world, and, and Junger says that this there is a new demon, he calls them titans. We are in, in a titanic era, an era where the old gods have gone, have abandoned it, this modernity, and new forces have come or, or corralled by some higher demonic principle, which takes the shape also of all this technical, uh, all these numbers and magnetic impulses and this highly computerized thing and, and so on. And in our talk, he says, and there are also some forces of the ground which are attracted to this new advent of this new mechanical monster and all of that conspires to create something really dangerous and, 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 and very scary. And I forget when, uh, when that, uh, I should know actually, when that was written. No, that was written in the 30s, but 39. so it was 39. 39, yeah. In uh, Gartenstrasse or Garden. Yeah, Gartenstrasse. So yeah, 39. So, and that, and you see, and when the advent of the atom, atom bomb, I think he must have felt even more vindicated. And as he should have, 
My whole point in, the, in that article, my whole response to that is yes, I acknowledge the transformation and we are under the, uh, we are under the, we are in the era of really of titanic, nasty forces, no doubt about it. And none of us feel too certain and too cozy about what's happening around us in any way, despite the fact that we may pray or tell ourselves it's going to be okay, but deep down, everybody's afraid. But I'm saying this whole story of faceless power, decentralized power, nonsense. There's a bunch of machines with a control panel and access keys and passcodes. And all of these things are in the hands of oligarchies and groups of people that are in charge of the machine. It's very personalized. It's not impersonal at all. So I'm just saying, yeah, on the one hand, yes. And on the other, let's not forget that we are dealing with, it's not that these machines are there and we're like in, in one of these movies that I've just mentioned. No, there are people who are behind the control panel. And so politically, there is a war to be waged. So, and, uh, and, and everybody is really scared by that too. They don't want, uh, they're afraid. And I, and I get that. So to, to, to recapitulate, your concern is that emphasizing the so-called autonomy of the techno structure is problematic because it feeds into a kind of masking or camouflaging of the actual structures of power. And yes. the fact that there are quote unquote people with names and addresses who yes. are at the commanding heights. Uh, yes. If we become hypnotized by the impression that we are in the grips of this uh, decentered framework, uh, then we're, we're left deep, uh, with a, a sense of impotence, which is very difficult to, to overcome. Uh, yes. It reminds me of a passage from um, The Grapes of Wrath, um, where Tom Joad is, uh, you know, going, you know, he's very frustrated with what's happening and he wants to confront the person who's about to dispossess him of his land. And he's like, then that person is like, well, no, no, you see, I mean, I'm just doing what I'm told, you know, it's like, well, where's your boss? He's like, well, my boss is just doing what he's told or whatever, and so on. He's like, well, who do I shoot? And, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, so if you like, get transfixed by that question, who do I shoot? Right. Um, you're kind of left really incredibly frustrated. And um, now I will say that it's, I think personally very difficult to avoid that impression uh, because you, know, you cited the example of the phones. Another example would be the way automation keeps showing up all over the place, like at the grocery store, you know, there's almost all sort of self checkouts now. So you can't actually go to a human being to be like, you can't like, how are you, how are you going to challenge that decision? Right. You know, you might be able to like take a stand on one issue, but it's, it's all over the place. So, um, yeah. so, uh, how do you address that? And then I do want to circle around back to the question of specifically the amoral quality of the technicity. Uh, I think that there's a kind of ambiguity in what is intended by the notion of amorality there. On the one hand, it's touching upon the common thesis that technology is merely instrumental, that whether it's good or bad derives from context. And I'm going to resist that characterization. I think that specific technologies do have a moral valence with which to, to reckon. Uh, but I, as I noted, there is an ambiguity in the notion of amorality. It's also immoral in the sense that technology is indifferent to our moral valences, our, our status as, as, as moral entities. So where I think a more concrete hazard exists is in the implementation of so-called AI protocols to make social policy decisions because those decisions are indifferent to the humanity of the people who are um, under its aegis. Even if it's some like, you know, notional plutocrat who's making the decision, he still has some residue of humanity which might stay his hand for more obscene um, possibilities. So, um, so those are two different issues, I suppose, that, that whether or not 
technology is actually amoral and then amorality in the distinct sense of it being indifferent to human dignity? No, well, I think they actually they're connected. I, um, I, 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 I envision societies uh, as, um, as anthills. Uh, like I, 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 I've studied a lot um, uh, slave making ants and uh, I, uh, so from a sociological viewpoint, and I've learned a tremendous lot. I'm still studying it. And, uh, and the analogies are fantastic, They're just formidable. And, and a lot of people say, well, excuse me very much, but we're not insects. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I know that. Nevertheless, all the more so as that in this change that we're witnessing that we're afraid of and the AI and the, and the new transformations that we're undergoing, for me, uh, we are going, the, the, the plan, and, and, and this is why I see it in an anarchistic fashion, the plan of the people in charge with names and addresses who are governing these machines is to transform evermore our societies into mechanized termitaries and transform and to insectify our lives as much as possible. And that comes with a lot of things. Um, the technology streamlines and regiments, all that, all the hue and cry about gender theory and all that is pretty plain what they want to do. And it started like 50 years ago with all the campaigns for abortion. It's about sexual management and procreation. In terms of their nutritional requirements of the elite, which is in, state, in the state sense, a parasitical body, they need a lot for this transfer of resources, but according to their needs and according to the techno-structural needs of this elite, they don't need that many of us there working for them after all. And they do not know what to do with all this excess of flesh. And apparently, uh, preconizing and, and advocating contraception and abortion endlessly to curtail this mass of flesh they don't know what to do with is not enough. In their long in their long term and big plans and horizons, they really want to re-engineer the whole thing. This is why they need to break down the the familial nucleus and the the, the procreation roles, and so all the kind of the pop acrimonious battle that's played out on the surface, deep down what they really want is to get rid of this problem. They, they just don't need that many people to cater to them. Technology serves that. And they don't need geniuses. They don't need scientific geniuses. They need highly skilled physicists and mathematicians to uphold and discover technologies that sustain the prevalent distribution of resources from the bottom to the top as they are now ever perfecting them. and as it goes on, get rid of all this mass of people. They don't know what to do, not to mention the less developing world or the what we used to call the third world. For them, it should be just incinerated, but they don't know how to go about it. So they started with the AIDS campaign, for say, and it only went so far. So there's still a lot of work to do in that, in that regard. And this is why te technology is also, and you're right, I mean, it's 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 not it's it's actually much more complicated than what it is because the technology they use is a very particular form of technology. It a techno it's the only technology that sustains them. We all remember what happened when, in the late eighties, they made that announcement about cold fusion, and and we saw where that went. I mean, they completely shut it down, and now we're starting to talk about it because apparently Bill Gates is interested in it, but. You know, they tell us, they set the agenda, because if that were to happen, and that was technology, it was phenomenal technology, we know it worked. My own father drew up a theory for it, and, and I was in that world, and I met all those people, and those were, and we, we, those were really high-level scientists that replicated the experiment all over the place. And so, and then, you know, just to give an example, so technology, that was technology too, but it wasn't pursued. Well, of course it wasn't pursued because if you start giving free energy to you're just you're going against everything they're trying to do you know you're, you're trying to give even more wealth to the bottom and they don't want that they want to keep the bottom of sustenance and continue with this transfer of resources to them which as we know the disparity between poor and rich has grown considerably with the financialization of the world uh which has gone on when they shifted gears in the late 70s under Volcker and and so on and so forth and that that whole story about 
how the uh, American engine for financial domination changed, was overhauled in those years. Um, having said this, um, so you say people who handle these technologies are humans. So still there's a residue of goodness in them. They cannot be such monsters in implementing them. Well, it turns out that I would want to think that too, but that's not the case because the vast majority of the people who enforce these techniques and the propagandists who in the universities write eulogies about these things are technocrats, people inducted into the elite. And those people are work for the parasites and they are few. They get those few plum jobs. They earn well, a lot for what they're really worth. And they are nested in the structure comfortably enough to say that everything is well. It's the rest of us who are just pooping our pants and are really worried about what's gonna happen next. But this is where the thing is. So technology, what we call technology is technology of a very particular sort. It's a technology that behooves and benefits them and all the, and all so-called appar the apparatus, the academic apparatus, the publicists and the scientists that are in academia, they are, they, 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 they are you know, indentured to the elite. So obviously they're gonna push whatever works for the elite and not for the vast majority of the population, of the world's population. That draws me to, I guess, two questions, uh, which are also related. Uh, I guess I could ask you about the means of enthrallment regarding the people who are either at the height or the commanding heights of this apparatus's framework, the hive, the anthill. They are kind of, I presume, blinded by a particular perspective on human beings, uh, which is what enables their participation in this uh, in these in these hideous enfoldings, and, and um, or maybe this isn't so much a, a question as a remark. It could be perhaps be said that they perceive the mass of flesh, the human population, as a problem because they don't understand the human population as anything else but a resource or something to be exploited. And as soon as you see that then you understand why they're so willing to dispense in a relatively casual fashion with billions of people. Um, and so they don't actually see those people as human beings. And then this will actually lead me to the actual question. The question is when you talk about insectification or the characterization of society as you know, organized in that fashion, what is the, the ontological claim? You know. I mean, I'm guessing that what you're going to say is uh, we're not actually insects. The idea is to transcend this framework which pigeonholes us into a mode of being which is bit far beneath our actual dignity. Um, but uh, is is that what you're what you're suggesting? Now that we're insects, I didn't realize you're not saying that, but that we have to reconnect with a sense of what it is to be a human being and then realize that this sense of what it is to be a human being fully demands we no longer cooperate with these structures yeah yeah that's a good question uh that's the question because when i when i talk to to people and friends and and so on they everybody says yes okay all right, you criticize this you criticize that and we agree and this is this been it's so depressing and this and that but what are we going to do and yeah, what, what do I suggest? Um, there's no doubt if they keep going like this. So with the vast majority of people just being zombified or jobless, those who have a job are pretty much are, from what I gather both here in Europe. And I just just come back from a spell in the States in several years. And I've been and I've been living many, many years and and comparing how it is in, in, in the West. I mean, we're going to a, to a, a scenario where the middle class is now pretty much reduced to a thousand bucks a month, basically. So you tell me how to survive in this world ever more complicated where the bureaucracy hasn't slimmed down a bit and prices have gone up. How are you going to manage with a thousand bucks a month? You don't. At this pace, uh, stress 
and and everything else is going to lead you into an insectified life where you are going to spend most of your life under stress about earning enough and and yeah you're going to turn and and in and the life is already and the routine is already alienating so you're going to turn into an insect sure enough so how do we and so yeah and the questions of dignity and what we should be doing and the nurturing of the soul in other words we have to put ourselves and be in a situation where we only work for a few hours and the rest of the time is leisure, which doesn't mean that we're not doing anything, but we're actually nurturing ourselves, not just reposing or resting, but uh, reading, studying, uh, expressing us in, the, in, in different ways uh, where we become human beings again, where we do beautiful things and so on and so forth, you know, the arts and sciences. That's where we everybody should be, and that's where every talent expresses itself. But they don't want that. And another book, which I cite, but not because I'd like to drop names or like bibliophile mania. No, it's because it, it's just put. I, I say to folks, you know, put things into focus. So this, you know, Orwell wrote 1984, where he tells you this story about dystopia. But the interesting part of that is the book within the book where he tells you exactly what's going to happen. It's amazing. It's the blueprint of what's going to happen. So, and and the book is well known enough, right? Uh, at some point, I remember, or 10 years ago, it was selling more than Harry Potter's at one point on Amazon. And I thought, well, that's great. Well, then you, and then what people, so people do know, if you read that book, about you know uh, the the of the future of say of the Anglo-American bloc, which he calls Oceania. Well, it, it's that's right there. It tells you exactly what's going to happen. And before that, there's all the rules of how the the elites, or we'll call it the world elite, which pretty much is all the European satrapies and the rest of the world satrapies under Anglo-American command, because that's what it is, uh, will do. And what one of the main rules is that what and, and, and it's there and it's and it's written plain English and and it's simple. One of the main rules is that the, the surplus, because our societies and our modes of production are very efficient, there would be enough to feed us over and over again that we shouldn't be in this position. And Orwell says, no, the surplus, which yes, could be subdivided for the greater benefit and for this development of the arts and sciences will never be and should never be distributed because human beings have to be cast of sustenance so it has to be dissipated it has to be wasted it has to be shot in the air in these chronic ongoing wars so war is war is peace peace is war and so this is what and 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 that's you know we are going through a second iteration of the cold war where you have these wars that are just created out of nothing, where all the parties are agreed, that's the key point, because Vietnam was one of those, um, where it was agreed there's going to be to experiment and God knows what it was for, insurgent tactics or uh, of emptying the arsenal or trying new things. But, you know, and now we have the one in Ukraine. These are all Orwellian scenarios. They are choreographed wars where we should dissipate, you know, what we spend as the there is even rhetorically the question of how the money is spent to play these war games, aside from the victims, who gives a damn about them, but even the money spent for that, uh, well, that's exactly it. Well, I could get it, I could just build a clinic, or I just could get an extra check and not work for a month and read my, I don't know, uh, all of Nathaniel Hawthorne's books for once. No, yeah, absolutely not. You're going to see it a thousand bucks a month, and we're going to have our war games. And so... And so there's that as well. Yeah, you know, and I mean, there are not just well, I mean, not just uh, Orwell, you know, I mean, you have other, I mean, I even think in some ways you could look at Plato's Republic to go mm -hmm. way back as a sort of blueprint for the sorts of things that sort of shenanigans, which they, uh, you know, by which the, the elite operate. Um, but you know, so it's it's all there in the open, and as you say, like everybody knows, they know even if they just like watch popular, uh, like even the, the the first Matrix film in a sense lays it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, albeit maybe problematically, but that's just an example. Maybe you can there's a uh, so it's it's like an open secret if you like. It's an open secret. The reality yeah. of it. so how is it people are? But I guess there's a concomitant conditioning that. 
uh, many times the the rhetoric whereby the secret is disclosed suggests that people to whom it's being disclosed that they are powerless to stop it. There's almost a certain sadism in this sort of evil revelation. Like this is what we're going to do. What are you going to do about it? Nothing because you're powerless. Yeah. Right? Um, so yeah, what? Yeah. No. Well, yeah. Sorry, I had to respond. I forgot the yeah. most important question you asked me. What do we do? All right. Well. We're getting the and only we, way, the only way for me. Want to seem reductionist, like, oh, we need a pragmatic program or something like no, that. No, but, but, but we do. And in, and in broad outlines, and this is something that, I, and that and I've started lately, to, you know, we're getting organized and, and the world is getting organized. All of us have circle, circles of professionals and friends that want to do things and are thinking about how to do things. The only solution that we can have uh, in trying to resist this movement is to have some kind of communal response. And people say, well, yeah, that sounds nice. What the hell does that mean? Communal response. The way I see it is go slow under the radar and try to capture one little locality, one little municipality at a time and start a project. What kind of project? You might need a cluster of municipalities. The idea behind this project is to recreate the notion of what a community should be. This is the anarchistic dream, right, of free cities in the world that are federated to one another away from what we have now. You have to start very small and you have to create and understand what you're doing. And by this, I mean, if and here in Italy, we are trying to do this and it's complicated and but we are going, we're, we're moving, we're traveling, we're seeing what to do. In a nutshell, what I propose to do is this. Focus on a region and all regions, and some are more in distress than others, and see what the strengths are, where people are out of work, what they could otherwise do. And choose, say, um, say you have a city that has some people that have medical training that are not at full potential. So say maybe we might need a clinic. Uh, that could be a good thing for the community. So that becomes your spiritual project, the, the core. Around this idea, it could be anything else. So it doesn't have to be a clinic. It could be a, 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 a music, uh, it can be conservatory, it can be a school, or it can be whatever you want. Something that gives uh, gives some, some deep value and sustenance, spiritual sustenance to your communities or groups of communities, because you might gonna need more than one, because what, what I'm thinking is also, you're gonna have to support it. And by support, I mean, okay, let's say you're gonna build a clinic. So if the clinic, and that's gonna use all the resources we have in the territory, so a bunch of doctors and nurses that could do a lot more or are out of work and you're gonna need them and, and offer this service that a community needs, in order to create a hospital, you're gonna need people to feed these people, to clothe these people and, and so on and so forth and to house them. And so you're gonna create the economy that supports the project and the beating heart of the economy that, su that supports the project is what I call a communal mint. And that's the most important part. You're going to take the money away from the network and create your own. And so you're going to, and the most important way is in what kind of juridical framework can you do this before the authorities come after you saying that you are counterfeiting the currency, because that's the most important part. And so this is the project. This communal mint, in other words, you are no, and in this communal mint, you're going to create money in a way that's not the traditional one. You're going to insert at the heart of this project where you are creating a circuit around a spiritual idea, a money that's managed differently from what it has been done heretofore, which is the money with a, an expiration date, which I think is the most revolutionary notion in economics there is. And it's at the source of pretty much every kind of economic disaster in history that you may find, you can trace it back to the, na the nature of money itself. It's the fact that you know, resources, resources circulate and, and perish, but the money that accompanies it does not. That's where usury comes from, interest comes from, and, and the regular church has never understood this, which is astonishing. Not to mean, in the Western tradition, in the Muslim tradition as well, they fulminate, they fulminate against it, but they they have they have not understood where the where the seed of this evil lies. So this is what I propose: recreate these communal projects around this uh, communal initiatives around a, around a spiritual project where you create an economic circuit around it with a communal mint with perishable money. If you can do this, it's and create it one cell at a time, and we aggregate ourselves 
territorially and then eventually across the world, that would be revolution. And it has to be done in a, in, in a very particular way because if this takes, you know, if this takes off, they will come after you because you are slowly drawing resources away from their main centers of, you know, of, of collection of resources, which circulate through the banking system. That's the money and, and, the, serv and, and the debt service is the cheap ways of sucking money from the bottom to the top. And we're going and we're just cutting that nerve. So expect a lot of, not just a lot of friction, expect a lot of antagonism if you want to take that route. So this is what we're trying to do. But before you get to that to that stage, you know, you have to talk to people and get them out of their cocoons because they have no idea of how anything works and where to begin to do all this. And for a lot, nor do we, because it's all new, although they're, they're in the in literature, in the history, there are examples, but it is still new. So that is the project, if you ask me. So how, what do we do? This is what I would try to implement. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I have to think about that. I was going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, what are some antecedents that draw you to this uh, recommendation? So, for example, I know uh, you've mentioned in some of your interviews that uh, Proudhon, Proudhon mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if you're drawing on his um his work here in terms of laying this uh, framework, this economic framework of this cryptocurrency. Yes. yes. Uh, and I don't, I don't believe he had the notion of money's expiration, but I think he no. has a similar no. certificates. Or no, Proudhon, Proudhon is fabulous, and Proudhon is is our founding father. And no, he didn't. See, he hadn't. He, he was circling around it. And I, uh, and I will tell the story. I'm working on. I'm, I'm writing this. It's an extraordinary story. Of uh, on anarchism, I'm going to write this manifesto on new anarchism soon. I haven't been working on it for years. Yeah, he, uh, he even a genius like him, he, he was trying hard. He created a bank of the people where he, he didn't he didn't have the solution. You, you could tell he wanted it, and he understood where the where the physiology of the, the economic body went wrong in contemporary society. But so he created, he went to a notary, and in 1949 created this bank of the people. Where he invited all producers to in a common place in a marketplace in in this in this edifice in this building and with their wares their goods and they would get a piece of paper in exchange and then they would have to barter amongst them and away from the banking system and of course it never worked because you know you cannot transform perishable goods into money you know he was one step away but he couldn't get it uh what you have to do and this is another guy who grew in that tradition but he was a businessman he was um he was a german businessman who made his fortune selling dental equipment in 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 argentine in argentina and uh and he and it came to him he understood business he read Proudhon, and he said this is what you got to do you don't have to transform goods into money you have to make money mimic goods and that is make them die when I read that, me personally, I was floored. I mean, I was, I don't know, I was doing my doctorate in economics and knew that all, I had several years, I mean, I had a degree and I knew that I understood less of economics than I did when I was a child after that stupid degree. And even the PhD was even worse. But when you read these things and then you realize that there it was. And, 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 and you know, for me, I, I, world changed. And so we have got to do this. This is, this is revolution. This is power to, this is power to the people. This is, this is it. But so they were, really, sorry. Um, go ahead. Me, uh, is it possible to frame this proposal as a kind of negative interest system? Yes, like how, yes. Um, yeah, so the, the, whereas with the presumption of interest, money doesn't just persist, it actually expands and grows. Yes, because you cannot you, 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 can, you cannot stuff it, you cannot stuff it away, right? This is what you do. You cannot embarrass, you know, you have lots of it, you sit on top of it, you exact interest, and then you you strangle the community. But if the money reflects the goods that are there that have a life cycle, 
And people understand finally that saving is not saving, it's just deferred consumption. You don't put anything under the mattress. It's stuff, it needs to die, it needs to be. So you have a bunch of bricks that are being produced. You're gonna use half of them and the ones you don't use, you're going to give them to somebody else to build you a house. But this is what you should, and that's investment. Investment at 0% because the person who take those bricks to build you a house in a, in a year or so, is doing a great service because if it weren't for him, those bricks would perish and they would just rot slowly, rot into nothingness. But there is the that you give it to somebody who, through their work, keeps keeps the process going. This is what we should have: two bank accounts, a checking account that has a, a negative interest of to be determined, an average rate of depreciation. I don't know, five six percent a year where you keep the bare minimum and that really signals your purchase money that you use for goods that are about to die fairly fast for consumption. And whatever you're not buying goes into your savings account at 0%. Just completely, what, you know, <laughs> to a con modern conception, why would you want to do a 0%? Yeah, because people are used to, and this is the great thing, right? That we all live off more or less, depending how rich we are, but we're all involved into this usurious parasitical scam. Because when you have money in the bank that quote unquote works for you, you are extracting resources from people who work. You don't want to tell yourselves that because you love to look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself you're a good guy. But if you got money that works for you in the bank, you're not with the good guys in. You are with your exploiters. You are, even if you're a good person that works. But that thing already puts you into the parasitical explorative group, whether you like it or not, because in a proper physiology, you shouldn't have that in the perfect world. But people say, well, perfect world, that's utopia. I don't think so. It doesn't have to be. If only we were able to take our first steps in trying to change things. And this is where we are now. Call it the frontier. I mean, the, a current to me is that we are suggesting hopefully impels people to reconnect with uh, the concrete because if you're like thinking, oh i need to make more money that abstraction sort of takes you out of the actual circumstances of your life so you're no longer wanting to build a house just to have uh, an investment opportunity something which you can sell at a surplus right now the house is being constructed to actually provide shelter and so forth so the the hope is then to sort of transfigure the relationship between use and exchange value in a manner which restores the primacy of use value if you'll forgive my employment of those sort of classical uh, economic terminologies they're marxist but they're not just marxist they're also sort of smithian or ricardian i think so uh, yes and <laughs> as a, as a Proudhon, i'll excuse it yes <laughs> <laughs> I know you have your your apprehensions about Marx. Um, yeah, I do, but um, now there was something else that occurred to me. Uh, what was it? Um, oh, it'll come to me in a second here. Uh, oh, I know what it was. So something else that you discuss, uh, which relates, but we haven't sort of connected to it, is the question of the law of violence, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you have your most recent work is the uh, tyranny of uh, or the ideology of tyranny, excuse the ideology of tyranny. Um, and I haven't had the opportunity to read it, but do you bring this question of the law of violence in there, or how does that connect with what we've discussed, or what have you, or do yeah. you want to feel it in some other way? That question, sure, sure. No, it's uh, it's a great thing. Yeah, I got that um, that appellation from from Tolstoy, uh, from his confession. Uh, I um, I love Tolstoy. I mean, I yeah, he's he's uh, Dostoevsky. I don't I don't understand Dostoevsky, I, and I understand Tolstoy. And people say, well, that's pretty a symptom of how superficial one is, and maybe so, but at least I know what he's saying. And um, yeah, I got it from him, and he's and he says. We have to live according to the law of love. And unfortunately, most people in the world respond only to violence. Violence doesn't have to be brutality or just physical uh, truculence. 
It can be all sorts of bullying, a psychological demeaning, uh, higher, you know, living in a hierarchy, and 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 so that's it. And um, and it goes also to the uh, problem that relates directly to my other idol, my main idol, which is Thorsten Veblen, about. The main problem is about the instincts in us. He portrays it, you know, his, his theory is 100 years old, and he speaks still in very Victorian terms of instincts. But frankly, I don't know how else to put it myself, even after 100 years. I still think it's a good way of putting it. And, and in his vision, it boils down to the fact that we have what he calls this predatory instinct, which is really predominant and is groomed to be predominant in most people. Although not all of us are born with the same endowment of such aggressiveness and desire of bullying others and uh, going by the rules of rank and status, which are very strong and manifest themselves, of course, in the parasitical, the leisure class, of course, and mirrored in its barbarized ways by the low class, are a very important thing, completely lost on the Marxian vision of the revolution of the masses. Bevan would say, revolution of what? Most of them are as barbarous as their masters. And you know, in fact, World War One proved all the Marxism and the Marxists is wrong. They just slaughtered one another. And so, you know, without afterthought, and in the mobilization took nothing. So how could that be? Weren't they brothers across borders, all exploited? Well, apparently it doesn't work that way. There is this, it's about the psyche. And and the whole story of Tolstoy, who was born this exploitative, parasitical, leisure class baron, who you know, killed in war, exploited as serfs, debauched the female servants, and all of that was part of this predatory mindset, which was atrocious. And he spent the rest of his life before he attempt, after he attempts suicide, like pulling it out and like tearing it out of his flesh, it seems, because all the late writing of Tolstoy are about that. Just ripping out the predatory flesh in him to make him a pure being again. And in Veblen, I don't remember where I, it seems like out of 10 people, two are born with a very not barbarous type proclivities, cooperative, non-aggressive and so on. But the vast majority of us are in the middle. And the question is, and so you see even nowadays, right? You have kids or your parents before you, they don't want you to be a radical. They don't want you to change anything. They're worried about you. And they want you to be inserted at the highest level of the technocracy because you're gonna be nested in a position of privilege. And that's how it is. And now, and that's how it has to be. And screw the rest. The worst nightmare for a middle-class parent is to see his daughter or son fall just like in an old 19th century novel, fall down the ranks of status into ghetto land, right? Same thing. They don't want you to be in the dishonorable and indecorous world of work and indentured labor. They want you to be up there. All of that entails a vision of hierarchy, of power, of prepotence, and what we call in cheap language, bullying. It's always funny to see these governments and these school initiatives Oh, let's do this is bullying. Campaign against bullying. Stop bullying. Where the hell do you think the bullying is coming from? It's coming from the very heart of the system in which you live because it's structured on that. It's not at all structured on cooperation. Absolutely not structured on loving the arts and sciences. It, it, it's, it's built on values that are the opposite of that. Patriotism, respect for weapons, respect for armies, respect for um, status and the uniform and ranks and this and that and the other, which are the very opposite of the things that glue people together in the name of, I'm not even going to use these soppy words of love and compassion, but to just say of civility and decency in cohabiting in one another. Not, not any of them, I mean, none of that will be possible unless we're able to exercise and, and take away from ourselves, as Tolstoy tried to do, this instinctual apparatus of predatory appetence that we're always out there trying to get ahead because that's exactly what the system wants. And the question is then, so where is the problem? Does it lie with the subject or is it the social problem? My answer would be that I don't even have to postulate that man and woman is a good thing, that we're good, we're good people, not even that. For me, the conditions are very much, I see it very much in, in a social way. If you put people in a cage, no matter how structured and nice it may appear, and on certain aspects, but if it's structured like the cages we're in, you're gonna get a certain type of behavior 
And that kind of predatory mindset comes in. If you change the conditions, if you break open the cage and redesign the living space for people in a different way, chances are you not, might not get these monsters uh, that we witness every day. Where by monsters, I mean all of us, you know, despite, despite the fact that we tell ourselves that we're such good people. But that is the issue for me. I think that I am uh, somewhat more sanguine about human beings than you, but not radically so. I mean, I'm sort of, uh, but what, what, I mean, minimally what you're saying is that people are existing in conditions which induce desperation. Yes. So, what else are you going to expect? Yes, it is possible for certain individuals to mount a kind of resistance within themselves, but they are rare, sufficiently rare that you can't rely upon those uh, anomalies to, uh, on their own, bring about a transformation. You need to create counter structures, which rather than induce desperation, give people a sense of faith or confidence. Yes. And no, I... I Sorry, I, I, I'm sure I believe exactly what you believe, but I say this because most people, and I'm sure you've encountered this in your own discussions, after about five minutes that you reason along the terms that we're using now, they'll look at you with this hopeless look in their eyes saying, well, being human nature, what it is, da, da, da. Yeah. So in order to preempt that, I say, you know what? I'm not even going to postulate that we're good. Just change the conditions at the base. And you're definitely going to have an improvement. I mean, it is a kind of a useful way of uh, discharging from certain conversations the uh, confusion that can derive from emotionality. Like you said, you're abstracting from the word of love and compassion, not because you're opposed to love and compassion, but because those terms have been appropriated and, mm -hmm. and, and, and mutated and distorted by the, the the dominant discourses right i really right. actually think uh there are a few terms which uh haven't have you know maybe you got to be used very sparing because you don't want the same fate to fall upon them and i think decency is a phenomenal example like just just be decent and that Camus, i believe made a good deal of the notion of decency uh, yeah yeah well it was it was it was von kurt vonnegut was saying that you know, make your best to be a decent person in a decent world. And I'd say, that's great. That works for me. Yeah. Decency and civility. That's plenty enough. You don't have to go and, you know, use those big other, other big words. Yeah. I think honesty too. Uh, as Nietzsche has this quote, honesty is the forgotten virtue. <laughs> um, but um, Yeah, 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 yeah. It's been appropriated too in a way, but sure, of course. Yes, well. What can one do? <laughs> okay, so it's like you have to, in a certain yeah. sense, work with the hand that you're dealt. Um, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, just trying to think if there are any other points to address. Um, but I really I think we've covered a lot of territory. Um, the other thing that strikes me about you know organizing on a communal level is. is it really can be anything like it, it almost it can be subversive i'm almost wondering if you like don't even have to directly announce the project is subversive right you can organize a chess club or something like that and then yeah. just, it's an occasion for people to start relating in a manner which uh, is not instantaneously connected to exploitation um right. so. yeah build build something I guess one way of looking at it and the case in Italy and is, is typical, but it's all over the world. Build something for future generation that make them want to stay, you know? And, and I'm, we're thinking small town, but it doesn't have to be. Where, yeah, and, and, and build with you. That, that'd be good. Locality. Yeah. So well, I guess, I think maybe this is a nice place to sort of leave it for the moment. Are there, are there any other questions which you 
would like to address or anything you'd like to independently bring up? I uh, know. Why don't you tell me what uh, what you think? What is uh, what we should do, and what are things that have been what questions have been keeping you awake in general? Well, I I think one thing that really bothers me is our reliance on technology, or specifically digital technology. I uh, I am distressed by the extent to which it creates these false dependencies. We feel like radically dependent on frameworks that aren't actually going to be addressing what we need as human beings. Um, and I just have to attenuate our relationship with those terms. So that, I mean, it, it bothers me the enthusiasm with people with which people are, you know, running to things like uh, so-called AI and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm almost embarrassed to say it because it sounds like a cliche concern, but it's cliches notwithstanding. I, th I think it's 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 a very it's a very real problem. Um, mm -hmm. And part of it is that we've forgotten so much, or at least it seems that we've forgotten so much in terms of how to live. I was talking yesterday. With someone else about how if it was like 1907 most people in the united states or probably in the world knew how to build a house right yeah. you could build a house that's no longer true i mean it might be true in some parts of the world but certainly not here and it's just an example or i really feel that these modes of technology have contributed substantially to this de-skilling uh, mm -hmm. But on a deeper level, not with respect to like um, two other things that concern me is that people just, uh, and this might sound kind of soap and water, but uh, people just don't believe in themselves. They, they, they just believe that they don't have an option. They don't believe they have any power. There's an incredible passivity. And I, I think if there's anything to be done, it's to encourage people to realize that no, they, they can actually do something. And it's worth doing even if you fail. Uh, it's better to, and this is a bold statement, I suppose, but it's better to, 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 to die on your feet than live on your knees. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's true, I think, literally, uh, but it's also figuratively the case. And I like look at the conditions of labor with which people to which people consign themselves and then the stories that they tell themselves and make certain that they, you know, can sort of sleep at night. Or of course they don't really work. And it's like, no, like I, and I'm guilty as well, this to an extent, right? Because then the other thing that happens is we're we're all within a net of relationships. And so with those relationships come real obligations to family and friend. And then you're like, well, I can't just quit my job because then I have no money and I need some money in order to substantially contribute to the obligations, the positive obligations that I have to families and friends. So it's, it's something of a sticky wicket. How do you, how do you deal with the, the problem of having to participate in the system in some way that allows you uh, part of it is to just try and bring your family and friends to a point where they're not, you know, of the mind that you need this money, but, you know, people, you know, there are limits, right? There are limits. And then that's sort of where you transition into more revolutionary modalities. I mean, instead of paying the mortgage, you know, why don't we just work to transform property relations so you don't need a mortgage to have a house you know I mean, so right right uh, i mean what i mean so these are these are things that are circulating in my mind yeah in my heart um i think that uh at times i feel it's necessary to appeal like some to to, to some kind of transcendent like, it, yeah. like um but what does that look like right what does that look like um, any, you know, I mean, it's almost like you have to have faith in the assistance of the transcendent, but act as if it isn't there. Um, and just, uh, act with, you know, faith in 
in a vision which persists despite a presumption of ultimate failure. Um, it's kind of, uh, and now and a lot of people don't have the stomach, I think, for looking at it like that. I don't know if I have the stomach for looking at it like that, but um, that's, you got to you got to start somewhere, right? Right, and um, you know, alternate. The, the, I mean, I also think, by the way, on a more hopeful note, that a lot of people share these instincts. I, and I think you've said similar things, but I think a lot of people are anarchists without realizing that they're anarchists, mm -hmm. right? Like, I am an anarchist. I enjoy telling people that because it still seems to have a kind of shock value. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, but I didn't arrive at anarchism because I read a particular anarchist or what have you. To me, it's right. just intuitively the case that you don't want to have a disequilibrium or power with any other human being. It feels weird, all right? It feels right. weird to be in a, for me, it feels weird to be in a position of dominance or submission. Yes. Okay, yes. I mean, it's obviously nobody likes to be in a position of submission, but like, you know, in a situation of dominance, it feels weird, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even if like you're like, teaching something to somebody like something trivial like oh okay well this is how you uh you know take someone to you know go climb the first time you're trying to teach them how to you know tie a figure eight knot and then like even in like that seemingly pedestrian uh interaction something like a power dynamic can arise where the person becomes submissive to you in a way that's like, no, no, this is just tying a knot. That's, I'm not that good of a climber. I'm not whatever. Okay, <laughs> just chill out, man, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. And uh, and conversely, you know, the submission thing. I don't. To me, it's obvious. Like, but um, that you don't want to be submissive. Like, it just feels terrible. So right. if this is just like a, a very obvious way that human beings relate, more or less, in terms of equality, and that that's what makes us happy. Why in that? hell would you nest yourself in a society that presumes a maldistribution of power to, 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 to reproduce itself, you know? And uh, it's, it's, it's completely incoherent. So- I know, I know. So I- Yeah, I, 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 because I think you're, no, but, it, but you nailed it. At heart, we're all anarchists because, uh, if, because that's the case. We wanna be left alone, uh, but we wanna be, amongst folks and do fun things, but we want to be left alone. And uh, yeah, it, it is it is the natural state. Um, and uh, I think we have to find the right social physiology to, to, to make it be that way. And right now it's anything but. So yeah, I agree. Well, thank you. I, uh, I thank you. you leave it there for now. I do appreciate it. Maybe we can find another topic to take up at a different remove. Um, and uh, and uh, thank you again, Guido. Thank you, Tom. All right. Well, there you go. You have a lovely evening. Same to you. We'll be in touch. Ciao. Ciao.